Show that. Show that. I think we're working here with this mic now. Does that sound okay? I made half the stuff up on this uh, introduction there. Most of you don't want to know about. Uh, well, I want to start with some of the ideas that I've been engaging with uh, most recently. Um, I've been working with uh, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, with uh, Washington University in St. Louis, and with uh, Brookings Research Institute in Washington. Uh, two days ago, I just came back from working with uh, Hawaiian groups up on Mauna Kea. Uh, and the week prior to that, I was in Canada with the Shukotin people um, of Williams Lake and uh, the Kwa Kwa Kikwa Nation in Alert Bay. So I have a really wide range of places that I get to because although I trained as a sports psychologist, where I spend most of my time now is in population health. So I work with native groups all around the planet, mostly in Polynesia, some into uh, North America and into Canada. And my main role is looking at health promotion that uses the environment. And by this I mean that where I'm pushing uh, native populations, for want of a better word, is towards the idea that health has nothing to do with humans. Health is a consequence of what we learn from the environments that form us. And as an approach for native people, uh, it's gaining traction because at some level, probably at the blood memory level, uh, our people and other people globally as natives are recognizing the importance of collectivity. That the current model that Trump's promoting, and other governments as well, of consumerism, of neoliberal thinking and capitalism, has a limited shelf life, and that not all of us can have everything. And so at the moment, and I haven't seen this drive for native information at all at the level it is now and in the last four years a global interest in native or in ancestral knowledge has grown to a level I've never seen. So the time frames for trying to understand what's happening in these spaces has captured a couple of universities that I work with in the States. Um, I'm also a um, what do they call me, an honorary research fellow to the School of Population Health, Auckland University, which I think is a really long term for them asking me stuff and then paying me nothing. Uh, so I consult to them, but through them I've expanded out into a number of other areas. The work that I've been doing with the US uh, fraternity in that space has been around an area called systems dynamics. And systems dynamics is understanding causal connectivities between environments and what we see in people. What I've been talking to them about is that actually Māori have been practicing this for 2,000 years. Uh, a whakapapa based approach to population health is the same thing. A systems dynamics was established in the 1970s and it was established to determine where infectious diseases were going. That's why it was developed, to try and predict where chickenpox was going to head because of the complexity of the issues surrounding it, population health had to figure out a way of how many would go to the morgue, how many would be carriers, how many wouldn't know they were carriers and would infect others, and how many would recover. Because of the complexity, they had to come up with a systems analysis approach that looked at that. One of the systems they used was computational modeling. I'm going to get to the point. I know this stuff sounds boring so far for some. Some love it. But Computational modeling was one of the models that was produced. The other one was the development of a whole series of ways of capturing information. And I may show you a drawing of some of those soon. Those are called causal loop diagrams and stop and flow diagrams that show the interconnectivity between environments and what we see in the people in our district or within our catchment. Now, Whakapapa has been practicing the same thing for quite a while. And what we've discovered is that although they're using different words and names, it's exactly the same process. They're a little bit upset at me when I said to them, we've been practicing for 2,000 years. You started in 1970, but we'll help you catch up. I'm pretty sure they thought they'd had it um, nailed up until that point. Uh, but the reason I'm telling you this is that uh, in terms of what we're doing with population health, what we're doing with physical activity, outdoor education, uh, working with 
uh, DHBs, working with health organisations across the country, and dare I say it, we'll eventually end up working with councils in terms of population health, a whakapapa-based approach has unlimited potential to shift the health outcomes of people within your catchment. And this is going to be through understanding the environments that form your catchment better. Are you okay so far? Jump in whenever you like. I can see some of you smiling and others look at me like, I don't know about this idea. It's tough, we're going to carry on. So, uh, a year or so, uh, two ago, um, you'll find this interesting, I did another degree <laughs> in environmental management. Uh, I did a postgrad diploma in environmental management. My wife said to me, that's probably enough. You've got six degrees, when are you going to actually do some work instead of goofing off? But it was important to do that to understand the capacity of the um, Resource Management Act, how uh, we could engage with that act to increase our accessibility into spaces in ways that would allow us to affect a health change. So the RMA and some of the work we're doing with population health are now becoming more and more closely connected. Now in the past, we've always seen health is sitting over here and some of those environmental issues sitting over here. Uh, they're coming together faster than most um, organisations can cope with at the moment. Now part of the reason that we're also trying to promote the idea of environmental understanding and its effect on human health is that we have the potential to improve environmental sustainability but also climate change through understanding ancestral information, all of which will supply incidental benefits to people within those districts in terms of their health. Now for Māori, what we've been doing over the last 60 or so years is trying to follow a model that's human-centred and individually-centred. Now you'll see and you'll notice when any Māori stand up, they'll tell you which lake, which river, which body of water and which mountain has formed them. We're environmentally centred and always have been. But in the last 60 or 70 years, we've tried to transfer into that space of being individually centred for health and it hasn't been working. In fact, our health has been deteriorating faster. So this is a suggestion of returning to an alternative model. Now, for the time being, uh, I'm not sure why any organisation would expect a different outcome using the same system of being individually centred around health and think that anything would change. So we have to supply alternative models. It just so happens that this is a model we used to use, went away from, and we're suggesting can come back. Now as uh, staff, as members, as people that work within an organisation like this, the ramifications for your roles, the um, implications are far reaching in terms of how you administer and engage with your environment because there's going to be incidental consequences if we follow this path for the health outcomes of your communities. This may mean that when it comes to building a swimming pool, we'll have a completely different structure in how we do that because we'll quickly want to move them from concrete out into other spaces that connect directly to environment. It also means that if you supply health facilities that might have a gym, instead of having a gym facility, it may have to be split into three buildings. One that attends to the physical component, one for the psychological, and one for the spiritual. And that we may have to build into the centre of those buildings the opportunity to engage with Ongo Māori, which might mean putting planter boxes in the centre that they can eat while they're training and around the facility putting the, the equivalent of play gyms for elderly to improve their power and agility instead of aerobic conditioning. So it may mean that we're going to restructure the way we provide facilities. You okay? Ooh, that was easy. Encouraging stuff because at the moment with wicked problems uh, being global climate change, uh, environmental sustainability being so complex, we're having to look at other systems and, and figure out different ways of trying to negotiate through those or navigate through those systems approaches or whakapapa approaches are some of the things we want to use for that. Whakapapa in the past has been used as something that looks like a list of names. Do you agree with that? 
Papa Papa is often something that's recited by people when they want to show a connection between their situation and someone else's. What we've been suggesting with Whaka Papa is that it's the equivalent to systems dynamics when it's used in an alternative uh, process. And by this I mean that Whaka Papa is no longer a list of names. What Whaka Papa should be is an action research process. So this means that instead of being a list of names, we use it as a means for understanding the implications of the line between the names. So in the past, if some of you have a list of who your grandparents were, great-grandparents and so on, and down to you, the name doesn't matter now. The line does. Because something changed when those two things came together. And we're suggesting the same things are happening in environments. When we put two environments together, we want to know what the causal outcomes are. That's using a whakapapa approach. You okay? Whakapapa is also providing us the opportunity to track back and trace back to the origin of thought on a particular initiative that you may use in an organization like this. And we need to be able to show a rationale for why we're choosing a particular approach. Whaka Papa allows us to do that. Now you can call it systems dynamics if you want to, or systems thinking. They're exactly the same. But because this is Tiarawa, and you're heavily influenced by the people of this area here, you have a contextual relevance in using Papa in an alternative way. Still okay? This is the easiest talk I've ever done. Nobody wants to have a shot so far? Some of you are looking a little bit grumpy. I think I can handle it, though. Okay. So what does this mean in my particular role in health promotion, population health, working with other global groups, is that now we're looking for and developing examples of tribally centred or district centred health and physical activity programs. Instead of being pan Maori or pan country, we're looking for more diversity than we have in the past. This means that in this district here, we should be able to show a difference through your facilities that uh, pursue health that are quite different from Tainu, quite different from Poro, quite different from Tupare. In the past, what's happened with initiatives that have come from organisations like the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education, incidentally, and Sport New Zealand, is that they've tried to promote pan approaches to those. What we've been suggesting is that part of the reason for the lack of sustainability and recruitment of Māori to these programmes is because of a lack of contextual relevance that's driven by the district they come from. You with me? Yes, ma'am. think so. With a pan Māori approach, if Te Arawa were to develop their health initiative that's centred on here, anybody else could use it if they choose to allow others to use it. It's up to Te Arawa. And I would suspect they would. Well, out of interest, uh, yesterday, this is fresh off the, the boat, uh, I met with um, Sport New Zealand last night, uh, before I came here. Uh, they have the HOP program, which is, uh, help me out here, Te Oranga Pautama, which 
churches where they have a number of groups going out into communities and talking to them about health approaches. Uh, one of the initiatives that Sport NZ is about to kick off is to shift away from being sport and exercise based to environmentally centered. So they're going to be land or water or other connections to environment that will underpin the sports that they engage with. Now the implications for this is this is about to go into schools as well. So they're going to supply from their regional sports trust instructors that can connect schools up to their environment within their own district and teach them the diversity and differences of their district versus another district in another place and how from that they can build health outdoor education, any number of curriculum-based topics that they want to pursue. This is a Ministry of Education and Sport NZ initiative that's going to be kicked off in the next six months and spread across the next three years and hopefully after that as well. So I hear what you're saying and that there's a number of divisions there are sat at not only a, a, a tribal level, but within Kura, we're seeing Kura A Iwi and Kura A Rohe splits at the moment. Where for that issue that you're talking about, some feel as though they're not getting access to the information they want. This is an attempt to try and supply a diversity and scope of information that will be built not only by people like me, but by the Iwi, by the Rohe, by the Kura itself, that might allow those that are slipping through to be captured. You're looking at me like, that sounds like a load of crap still. I agree with the last part, they're definitely getting worse and this is an attempt to build some models that will help underpin some of the prerogatives that the treaty is trying to support because these are being built by Kura, by Māori, for Māori, so it's an attempt to do that. Yes, absolutely. Anyone who's Pākehā can come into a Kura, it's not exclusive at all. So, shall I carry on? District-centred physical activity and nutrition is a model that um, we're pretty excited about because um, it allows us to show the specifics of a certain area. And one of the models that, or one of the platforms that we're using to do this is we're building Google Earth virtual tours. And I'll show you a couple of models of this soon, actually. With a Google Earth uh, virtual tour, it allows us to show locations within your district, point out which, for example, Atua, Kaitiaki or Sipua, may have existed in that area, what types of physical activity and nutrition could be obtained from that area in the past, and what can be obtained now. We're using Google Earth to provide examples of that. And the other part that um, we're kind of excited about too is that in this approach that we're looking at the environment, the overarching philosophy is ancestral knowledge, and that's the part that we're using as the lever for why we should or are able to encourage Māori to engage with this product or this process or this idea is that it's not about health, it's about ancestral knowledge. So that's the philosophy that's the overarching principle. Now just below that is the whakapapa concept of we have to show a contextual relevance for the people we're working with in that district for why they might engage with that. But the third level down from that is the huahua tau which is the metaphor for what is it we're trying to teach from that environment. Now in the past, and this certainly happens in a number of schools that I've worked with, they're trying to reproduce sports academies with the hope that if they roll out a rugby ball or a netball, they'll see changes in their students. What we're trying to do with this approach is be far more definitive in what we expect to happen and giving models and examples to Kura of what we would like to see transferred from one environment to another. This allows us 
to perpetuate and carry on with the idea that us were provided for us or environmental representatives that show models for what we're supposed to learn by going into that environment. Now in your context here, and I'm an avid mountain biker, I love it, which is why it was really easy to come here. As soon as this finished, I'm off for a ride. And you don't see many Māori out there, but it's growing. We're starting to see a Māori presence out in the forest there. And when I see them, I say, what are you doing here? What are you up to? Oh, I'm out for help. I say, oh, I'm out for the mountain. I come to visit your fellows moaning every time I'm here. This mountain bike, hui hōrino, is just a means to get access. The mountain bike doesn't matter to me. Coming to meet your mountain allows me to know you better, to know who it is I'm working with. If I get in one of your lakes, I get to know you even better. So I might do that with a waka. But a mountain bike, in my opinion, what it gives to us is an opportunity to engage with whakapapa at the coalface. If I know a maunga better, then I know how people will react to me. When I go out into the mountains here and I start to ride, if it's steep straight away, then that gives me an idea of how the people will be towards me as well. If it's a little bit more mellow and then steepens at the end, I can expect that from the people as well. And you know there's a difference between the West Coast and East Coast people. You see that in the uh, interior as well with how the mountains are structured. How they're built is also a reflection of the people. So when I come here to ride, actually I'm trying to get to know people here better because the mountains will lay that out for me. So it's why I come back as visitors. In essence, I'm going to see old friends, which are some of the mountains here, because they've given me wisdom and experience beyond anything I could have expected from people. And if you like, they're the oldest source. They've been there for a million years. I think sometimes when we take people into those spaces, they don't have the right glasses or, or headphones on to hear and see what the mountain's trying to transfer to them. This approach with taking an environmental stance is allowing us to teach more of the content and then show the life skills development opportunities that mountains and water provide for us. So it means being a bit more creative and innovative in what it is we hope we can get return from. Still with me? You need a break or you're doing okay? Arty. So, in that space, if I come back to it, we've got at the top part there, Mātaranga Māori, we drop down into Whakapapa. Hua hua tau was the metaphor. Under that is the whakapakari tinana, or whakatinana tanga, which is the action phase. And most of the organisations I work with, be they health, outdoor ed, uh, physical activity, GHBs, they all want to start at this space here of action, without any rationale for why, who and what it is we're trying to teach. For Māori communities, they absolutely need to know why they're coming. And the why can't be health or physical activity. It has to be some other essence for why. Otherwise it's not sustained. Ancestral knowledge for that iwi in that district is that part. When you can show a relevance to Whakaua or to any of the iwi within this district that this is your knowledge, they'll go after it. And through that, we improve the health outcomes of the people of this district. So, that's in that phase over in this one part of my work is looking at um, why, who, what and which. We've just shifted into another space that is the when. This is probably the most exciting space at the moment is now we're starting to reintroduce ideas of seasonality and monthly rotations for when we should do these things. And this has implications for when you're going to run programs within your district because it's allowing us as Māori to shift away from the Gregorian calendar and the sun and shift back to the moon. And the implications of following moon phases in terms of when we run programs has a more consistent and authentic rationale for why we should run programs in certain times. Now for some of you this will be quite a big step but for Māori it's something we practiced in the past and we're returning to with a level that I haven't seen in the last 10 years either. The interest in Maramataka is huge. The interest in Atua has been huge. Maramataka is driving our sector in health and physical activity at the moment, absolutely. Now if I give you a bit more information about uh, seasonality and Maramataka in particular, Maramataka has been used in the past to define times for, for example, planting, 
for fishing and for hunting. What we've shifted into is a new space, and when I say we, it's just me, really, because I've got no mates, uh, other than this one's brother. Uh, we've been shifting it into understanding when are the best times for rehabilitation, the best times for aerobic conditioning, the best times for agility, the best times for quickness, the best time for health pursuits. So not only are we looking at planting, fishing, and environmental, but we're also looking at the human effect of moon phases, which means that instead of running a program that starts at 6 o'clock each morning and runs across six weeks, we're shifting to moon phases of when we should start that coordinate with tidal movements, understanding that on an incoming tide, we can transfer new knowledge to the recipient better than we can on an outgoing tide. And that across that month, there's going to be two peaks within the one month that are preferable for when we can produce better power outcomes. Which means that, for example, and this has been quite a recent one, I've been working with a powerlifting group in San Diego, and I've shifted them to a maramataka approach and their lifters are producing far bigger volumes of how much they can lift now that we've shifted them over to the two peak times within a month. They don't know that they're training under a maramataka approach. So, while this is a form of environmental science that we've used for over a thousand years, it's going to take some time for us to reinstitute that back in the community. But the main part about that isn't the health outcomes for humans. It's about the ancestral knowledge, about the sustainability and the recruitment of people within your communities to something other than health, but something that has incidental gains for health. This is population health underway in a way that allows us to be health by stealth. They don't know. They believe they're pursuing ancestral information, but the consequence is health. Now, I would hope, and I presume this is the case, that Health and education are uh, major drivers for this council, no doubt, through the environment as well and the facilities that you build, the programs that you run. This means that we have the potential to follow a different process and improve our outcomes. You're still all right. How am I doing? Okay. So uh, I'm pretty excited about the when part because not only we're we talking about seasonality, we're shifting down into uh, Maramataka approaches. Um, Auckland Council, for example, they've been running some of their meeting rooms with uh, meeting plans and times that align with tidal movement. That's quite a big council to be trying to engage with this. Some of you may know or heard of Riata Makiha. He's one of the tohunga in the space of Maramataka. He works for Auckland Council. So he's helping them shift into a new space, a new frame of understanding when and why they're doing things. Interesting, eh? Now, in the why phase there, we all, uh, when, sorry, we're shifting down through seasonality and into months. Now, the space that I'm teaching at the moment to schools, and we're building programs around this phase is Tohunga Tonga. Now, Tohunga, some of you will know or heard of as experts, but if we break that word apart, Tohu means to understand a sign and tohunga are people that read signs and know what they mean. Tohunga tanga is the understanding of a whole range of different signs and what they mean. Now, most of the organizations I work with, they have to fill in risk assessment, management, and safety action plans for any process that engages with communities or with their schools or whomever. Uh, we're shifting out of that and into a tohunga tanga approach that allows us to teach our kids how to read, Trees, fish, birds, insects, and weather patterns. So we shift from season under the Atua Kopeka into Marmataka, and Tohunga Tanga is allowing us to teach three and four day risk assessment models based on reading those five areas. So the two schools I've worked with already <coughs> will get to the gates of their school grounds, and we've got named trees on their school grounds that they read to understand what the risk is of leaving their school. Now this means that there's named wind for those trees, such as the ho tō, which is the wind that only affects the tōtara, 
that's on the east side of the school, and if it's above 15 knots, the torso tree will move. If it's under that, it won't. So if we have a discussion about the whole tour, the rest of the group know that we're talking about a high wind coming from the east, but that it should be a warm wind. Versus Raka Maumau, who's a southerly wind, and affects a different tree, has a different name. So this means that when I have a discussion with these kids about the name of that wind, they know what the risk is for leaving, and they make their own assessment. Which means that for districts and catchments, we're starting to build environments that we can use as indicators for when things are risky or not. And that people can learn to go to and look at and say, well, maybe not moment today, maybe late today. These are all variations on ways to teach environmental information that has incidental benefits for the catchment that we're working with, whether that be a school or a community. Okay? Here's an interesting one for that one as well. Well, I think it's interesting. I kind of um, geek out on these kinds of things, but um, I've been teaching kids how to read spiders. In New Zealand, now Aotearoa is quite interesting, even in relation to Hawaii. Uh, we're never further than, I think, it's five or six feet from a spider at any one day, at any time during one day. They're always near us. In Hawaii, not so much. But the implications for that in teaching kids how to read spiders is that I can take them to a spider on the school grounds that we've asked the janitor to leave there. And we'll go to that spider, we'll pull apart the cobweb, we'll go and ride mountain bikes for two hours, come back, and see how much of the web is being rebuilt to measure the time that we were away. Instead of using this, we're using indicators within the environment and particular webs that are built within that district. Now, the way we name spiders is there's three types of webs that we've recognised, those that go between two um, trees, for example, those that wrap around a part of a tree, or those that are sheets that go along the ground. So we've taught them how to read the different webs. And that means that if we're going to go riding and some have gone, we can lie down and we can see how many tyre tracks have gone across that web. Once we get into the bush, and there's two options, have the webs been broken here, they went that way. If they fall off and hurt themselves, then we collect up the web and we use that to take care of the injury. So the number of initiatives that we can use and teach from just one spider is huge. But the implication for health is actually what we're after. But we're showing ancestral knowledge and we're using, in that instance, mountain biking to get out there and do it. So it allows us to take care of risk assessment, safety action plans fairly easily. The Ministry of Education is a little bit nervous about this one. <laughs> Which I love. Whenever the government don't like me, I think it's a great sign. So into that area of uh, risk assessment, um, I don't like to use the word risk. I think it's another form of understanding environmental knowledge that's allowing us to shift into another space. It's pretty exciting stuff too. I like it. Oh, this photo here, uh, this is around Lake Hawea down on the South Island. There's a tipua that lives up on the left-hand side of that mountain in the background. So I entered this race, and I'm off down there with our man there soon. To, um, we're going to be running over the route burn in November. I hope you've been training because I've got none and I've been in Hawaii eating training, that's about it. So he'll be running over the root burn with us, plus we'll be paddling in uh, Milford Sound before we do that, and then paddling on the other side and a whole range of things. Anyway, this space down there in Lake Hawi, I entered the race to be able to get access to the tipua because it's private land on the other side, so I had to ride my bike round, then I put the bike in a bush, then went for a walk up the hill to look for a tipua. Our tipa, for those that don't know, we have atua that are environmental representatives in our environment. And they have, for example, Tangaroa, God of the Sea, Pane in the forest and so on. There's more than 160 different atua, as it turns out, and more that are growing by the day that have been gathering together all these different names. You've got one here that's particular to, to you. Uh, Tutini Ariki. Um, this atua is the atua of blowflies. Not to sound bad, but, and I'll show you the story of this soon about Hatu Patu and what blowflies achieved and how in this space here, and only here that I've found, blowflies have allowed us to understand when we're trying to track someone and the ability to bring people back to life. Now in a Parker context, blowflies are seen as bad, but for iwi here or for Māori here, 
the blowfly represents a whole other range of knowledge that's specific to here and to the story of Hati Pati. It's incredible stuff. Anyway, Atua, Kaitiaki, which are those animals that are often seen as guardians of certain areas, and Tipua. A Tipua for us from Waikato Tainui, Tanifa a Tipua. Now, if you want to uh, drop this down into another way of knowing what Tipua means, Tipua is a Māori way of explaining an environmental anomaly. So they'll talk about Tanifa in the river, but what they're saying indirectly is there's a weird current over there that we don't understand, don't go there because you'll drown. But we'll use Tanifa to explain it so kids go, oof, Tanifa. But it's another way to suggest what's happening in there and the danger. So on the other side of this place here, there's a Tipua. And I found a map from 18, 1825, I think it was, drawn by a Māori fella for an ethnographer, a historian that came into this space and wanted to know all their areas. Firstly, I'm not sure how he knew what the shape of the lake was, because they didn't have drones. But he did. Plus, he'd written all the place names around the side of the lake. So I got on my bike and I went for a ride during that day to try and track where all of these place names were. And it said, on the other side of the lake is an abode of a tipua. So I parked up my bike and I went for a wander up there to try and find what this tipua was. Turns out it was a tarn. Do you know a tarn? Some of my mates don't because aren't from the south. A tarn is a small alpine lake. <coughs> this tarn gets up and walks around and moves. So the tipua, as far as they were concerned, was this tarn that shifted. And each time they turned up, it was over there or over here. I think what was happening is that as they were getting flowed down the hill, it would collect in different locations. But it was an explanation for an environmental anomaly. So I had to enter the race to get in there. The race nearly broke me in half. It's 160 kilometres of riding and filming that ended up taking 12 hours and four punctures. But the opportunity to engage with our communities by putting that out through Facebook and saying, have you seen these things? For those people from that district, that was a huge opportunity for them to value, honour and remember those ways that their people thought in the past. The other really interesting thing about this is this way, on that slide about another 50 k's near the end of the lake, there's a bunch of trees out in the middle of the lake that are still sticking up. And what happened was they dammed this lake and part of the area where the local Tangata Whenua used to live is now underwater, but the trees are still there. So they mark it out right off the edge of the lake. It's a really odd thing to see, but it's marked on the old map. So I collected that information up, drew up the information, put it out on Facebook on the mobile Wamanga for all of our communities to see. And the hungry ads for this information. And in your area, you've got a wealth of information that's pretty cool, that's connected to here. Goodbye. We all good still? I was a guide down in Milford Sound for a while when I was a young fella. Uh, I'm still really young. <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, when I kneel down for Haka, it's a half hour trip back up. <laughs> so, um, I worked on the root burn for a number of years as well, or Tarahaka, taking people through those areas, so I know this place here reasonably well. Um, what we've been working on is building VR and, and AR models of areas that are really hard to access. So virtual reality and augmented reality. Virtual reality allows us to take a journey through there and show what the highlights are for that district, and you've got a stack of those here. And I'll show you a model in a moment for what that looks like. We're still okay for time-ish. Well, it's okay? Got a nod. You all right? Okay, so those VR and AR models, uh, were a colleague of mine built one in Auckland recently on one of their parks, that when you arrive, an avatar of Maui pops up and has a conversation with you about where you've arrived at, which after I used to be there, and what kinds of physical activity you can get from there. There's one of the parks in South Auckland. It's cell phone based as well. I think that's going to continue to grow in that area. We're using 360 format to capture this where we're putting a, a 360 camera up to 500 meters um, and it'll capture everywhere within your district and you can scroll out to it using your finger on your phone or your iPad to go and view that area. 
which means we have one narrator in the middle, and from that narrator speaking, we can then go off and search this all on one screen. So it's allowing us to do quite a few things within any one district. So I think it'd be pretty exciting for this area here too. I can show you a model of that if you want to have a look at it. Yeah? Now, I think Google are fairly excited about this because they haven't seen uh, indigenous knowledge on this platform in the way we're trying to reproduce it. So it's got some growth yet, and I think that Google's excited because it's a, a different way of engaging with this space. Now, what I'll show you here is a tour that I did, and this is maybe four or five years ago now, with Te Papatākoro Te Arawa. So they helped build this one. And I suspect this would be the most useful way to do it in the future. Now this part here, this is a Google Earth virtual tour of where Hatu Patu travelled in this district. And this is just a random photo to start with. And these first three slides are to explain to people within Te Papatākoro how to build a, a virtual tour. That's its, its intent. The last four flip back to the earlier model I told you about of mātaranga Māori, whakapapa, huahuatau, whakatinanatanga. Ancestral knowledge, connection to the district, what we're trying to teach, and then the modality we use. So you'll see that structure on the left-hand side there, where it says mātaranga whenua, whakapapa whenua. This particular Google tour is connected to land, and it follows where Hatu Patu went. So, from here, I'll jump you straight down to the Mātaranga Māori area of the ancestral knowledge. And it zones in on this area here because this is where I had Stevie Temoni give me a, a description or explanation for Hatu Patu. And he tells me a little bit about the story of Hatu Patu, um, some of the variations. And that first slide there shows you a location where this was achieved, which is with this chat. If I can eat it, you know, I call you a kita kutu pula ya ya hatu patu. Ka ka kia inga kuroba kuye te poti ki utana farma ka amutu mete mea ni kuye te hea. Okay, so that's the first chat that I have in there. That's from this Google Earth tour. This is our first view. Now within this slide on the side there, you'll see there's a blue link in there. If I click on that, that's the one that sends me to Stevie. And Stevie tells me all about Hatu Patu. Now on the next slide, it takes us down to the first location where we find Hatu Patu, which is in that kohatu between Taupo and Tokoroa, where he turns up, and Kurongai took who's chasing him, and he hides in there. So, that's our starting point for one of the stories about this after Stevie's given us an introduction. Now, we've moved on from having the narrator in a, a whare to having a drone up to 500 metres with a narrator in the middle so that we can go down to the narrator and then out. So we can go exploring all of the places from the one screen. Does that make sense? So... <laughs> This is the starting point there. You'll see there's another link in there. If I go to that link, it'll send me to YouTube and show me how to Patu's rock. I'm going to get to the point in a moment, so just hang with me a little bit longer. The hua hua tau, or the opportunity to engage with other information, this is Whanga Pipiro. I was in there this morning when I was out for a run. I went past there, loved the spot, always go back to visit. find it really odd that it's in the middle of a forest, but I suppose that forest wasn't there before but there may have been other types of ngāhere, but I often go in there to see Whanga Pipiro and have a bit of a look around. So, Whanga Pipiro is the next spot that Hatu Patu pops up. Then he goes under, out, and then pops up again on Makoya, which all of you probably know. This is one of your ancestors, not mine. I'm from Waikapu, but I did this as an example alongside Papataku to show the expanse of what we can teach and how to do that. So, Turns up here, then the next slide is, and I'll show you this one actually because this is kind of interesting. 
I'll show you some of the 360 footage that we use to view this. That's a wee bit noisy because you have so many cicadas because it's so hot here. Now this is 360 footage. What this means is that I can turn this and go and look at anything I want. That there is Timidi, Timidi Dungi. Her brother is riding along behind me. So I can go and view any number of environmental aspects from the one screen and go and look at that. So I know what time of day it is by the shadow. I can check out which insects are there because I can go and focus in on those if I want to. I can hear them as well. I can see who's paying attention to what we're talking about when kids don't know it because I can flip around after I've done the program and see who was engaged and who wasn't. The interesting thing about this um, one here is um, brother is in the earlier piece of footage, he crashed. And I said, did you crash? He goes, nah, nah. I said, yes, you did, because I saw it. Because <laughs> he shot off the side of the track pulling wheel stands, he was bored behind me. So it could show all of these different things from the one screen, which is 360 footage. And it allows us um, the capacity that we just haven't had before. So, that's what we have connected through our Google Earth tour to be able to show a whole range of things. I'm still getting to the point because none of this is actually what I'm after. So, I've talked about Hatu Party turning up in a number of places, and this is the last place he turns up is out on Makoya there. Now, what I was after the whole time without them knowing was I took them to the rock first and we started on mountain bikes there. And I said, we can't leave this spot until we know that Kurungaituku is on her way. And they said, oh, we should probably start at 6. I said, why 6? Because that's when we normally go to the gym. I said, I think you're using the wrong kind of watch here. We start when we first hear the bird song that says that Kurungaituku is on her way, which is 4.30 is the middle of the night in my opinion but birds get up early so we're sitting there sitting there hear the first bird and off we go because Kurungai took is on her way and we're reenacting the journey of Hatu Pasu. we get to Whanga Pipiro we hop off and then we start running and we're running through the bush and we're using Whanga Pipiro as a measurement of time and the way we do this and this is particular to your people again is that they'll throw um, greenery into Whanga Pipiro and the colour change allows us to measure how long we've run for so when we came back, we can see that it's turned from green to white, and what level of green or white will tell us how long we've been out. Oh boy. You've got a learning mechanism right there in your backyard. Then, after coming back through there, we run down to the lake, and then we start paddling out towards Makoya, and we're going to leave some kumara out there for Hatu Party's journey. The whole time, they don't know they're doing a triathlon. They're only there to see where Hatu Party went. So I've achieved health by stealth. But the driver has been ancestral knowledge, and the driver has been information that's particular to Tiarawa. And Hatu Patu was the recruitment agent. Hatu Patu was what dragged them in the door. If we talk about that story of Tutini Ariki being one of those upper that you fuck up upper two, Tutini Ariki, in one version, was consulted by the mother of Hatu Patu saying, I can't find my son. And it was Tutini Ariki, the blowfly, that went out to find where he was. In some of those stories, it was Tutini Ariki that brought him back to life. In others, it's a means of tracking. Now, I teach young people how to track other people by sitting and waiting for blowflies. One comes through, another two, another three, we're going that way because they've left something behind. So I'll leave up to your imagination. So we can track people. Blowflies let us do that. We've learnt that from Te Arawa. You understand what I'm saying here? So this is a Google Earth virtual tour of ways that we can track ancestral information, but it's actually allowing me to teach health. So, what time did we start? 10.30? We're getting close, eh? I'm excited about what Google Earth can bring us and what it can allow us to achieve. And we're getting closer to streamlining it, I, su I suppose you could say. into these versions now. So now I'm starting to build Google Earth virtual tours for cemeteries and for sports fields. 
And for cemeteries, it's to understand in that urupa who's there, what they achieved and where they came from, which allows us to have a virtual tour of where they've been and then for people to go back and track that. If that's their ancestor, they can go back through time and see all the places they visited, the things that changed their thinking, that role of interconnectivity. Sports fields are allowing us to do exactly the same thing. Who played there? What did they achieve? Why did they get to that level? So we're building virtual tours for those which could work in your district as well. Uh, I think probably the most exciting one out of this at the moment is uh, I'm on the board for Mahurangi College up in Walkworth and we're building a fitness trail there at the moment that's got the parameters of using Google Earth in another way. What we're doing there is we're gathering together stock footage on the school ground, so we'll take a piece of footage of an area next to a tree, then another one by the river, and then another one over by the main highway, and so on. We've got 20 pieces of stock footage. Then the kids can come together, take pieces of that stock footage, build their own fitness trail, share it with another class, and have a competition. So it allows us to build fitness trails that aren't static that can change and be sent to other schools here and offshore to show them how we're pursuing health that's particular to that school. And Google Earth is letting us do that as well. So it's got heaps of range for us and a lot of scope for engaging with fitness trials in another way that we haven't in the past. Because one of the things I said is I don't want us to build a fitness area that's great for the first four weeks and then never used again. This allows us to keep recreating it. Every six weeks, we get a different design. Bye bye. I think we might wrap it up there. I've got a whole other range of things that I could talk you to death on, like I said. Um, and we can have some question time if you want to now. I wasn't quite sure what I was here for. Well, not really. But if any of that's interest to you, then maybe that's at the mark. I know there's a couple of people that um, have some uh, roles that are similar to this and it might be of use. And if you've got any questions now, now is your chance. Absolutely. Um, to be blunt, some of our kids are the best bullshit detectors I've found. Uh, which means that um, we have to be far more on the ball for when we provide initiatives because they'll see through them. If we can show contextual relevance to their particular context, it helps. Yes, sir. Well, I think there's two parts to that question, if I, if I might have a go at that with um, using some of the components of Google Earth and with systems dynamics more particularly, we can trace back the origin of an eponymous ancestor for why a particular group might have been named Tiarawa and what caused that to happen. But it also allows us to go backwards to find when an environment may have existed in a different format and what it's become. Um, it's been used to show the, I don't know what the right word would be, but the deterioration of the Incan people through to that civilization being lost so we could track back through systems dynamics and look at that. Now while that program is quite useful for doing that, um, it doesn't bring that environment back, but it allows us to teach some of the concepts that underpinned the engagement with that environment and then allows us to manipulate probably too strong a word, but to reconstitute those into contemporary situations 
that allow us either to avoid going down the same path or to look at new ways to reconstitute that environment in ways that can be valued now. So it means that uh, often I'll have questions about, I love the work you're doing with environments, but I live at urban, so how can I use that here? And we can still use some of the philosophical concepts, but we can also use some of those insects, like um, the spiders. They're going to be in urban spaces as well. Now, as far as that's concerned for physical health, when I gave the example earlier of reconstituting a gym into three buildings, when Māori will stand, they will often say, tenahotu, tenahotu, tenahotu kato, because I address your physical being, your mental being, and your spiritual being. Now, what's happened in the past is that most organisations I work with go exclusively after physical. Some will look at mental, very few look at spiritual. And those are for want of a better word, really. Now, I would suggest that actually in the way to a space over here is where we need to put a lot more effort because of its implications for mental health. And that physical health is a consequence of the other two. Now, with a study of the environment and the benefits in terms of uh, mental well-being through, uh, dare I say it too, for a, a number of our kids, the rate of anxiety is increasing tenfold in schools. Moving back into environments is allowing us to reduce some of that anxiety because we're not making it about people-centred mental health outcomes. We're making it about environments and that they can become calm again, they can align with the environment and not make it person-centred. And there's a stack of research that looks at the implications for engaging with environment and reductions in depression. Uh, there's a, a whole range of other information that looks at uh, preventing a number of mental health issues through engaging with environment. Uh, Parkinson's is another one, through walking through the bush and having to know where you're going to place your feet improves your agility but also sparks off uh, neurological pathways within your brain that send information to your hands and feet that help as well. So, in my humble opinion, I think we do have the potential to affect mental well-being through engaging with the environment.